when the Great War, which we now call World War I, started in Europe. Many young men joined up with their friends and brothers to go off to fight. Young men from the British Empire went to France to fight against young men from the German Empire. It did not take long for these new soldiers to discover the horrible realities of war. Both sides dug trenches in the ground a few hundred feet from each other in France and in Belgium. Between the trenches was a flat open space called no man's land. Young men hid in the trenches day after day as gunfire came from snipers or artillery on one side or the other. And to lift your head up out of a trench was to risk getting shot. Many soldiers were killed or wounded. When it rained, soldiers were trapped in muddy wet trenches with the task of endless digging as they tried to keep ahead of the floodwaters. When winter approached, there was more and more rain, and the trenches of both the German army and the British army were wet, cold, miserable mud holes. And as the soldiers huddled in these awful trenches, they began to wonder about the enemy so close by. Bored soldiers shouted at each other back and forth between the trenches, calling names, taunting one another. Each side sang songs to remind them of home. The two armies were close enough to hear one another's music. And always there were the rifles and the machine guns firing at any sign of movement outside the trench. Christmas Eve arrived in 1914. Soldiers on both sides opened the packages in the mud and wished with all their hearts to be home again. They began singing carols and making merry, as merry as one can be in a trench, when something extraordinary happened. Someone began to sing Silent Night, Stille Nacht in German, or perhaps O Come All Ye Faithful in English. But in any event, the soldiers on the other side knew the tune and joined in the singing. And the songs of the two armies sung in two different languages blended together in the night. Soon a German soldier emerged from his trench. Everyone held his breath, but no one fired. He had a sign that said, Merry Christmas. We not shoot, you not shoot. It wasn't long before a British soldier made his way into no man's land and then another and another. And soon all the soldiers had climbed out of the trenches and were greeting one another, enemy greeting enemy in the middle of no man's land. The officers tried in vain to forbid this from happening, but embodying the Christmas spirit of peace and goodwill, the men traded candies, swapped buttons from their uniforms and showed one another pictures of families back home. Someone even started a soccer game using an old ball and helmets to mark the goalposts. The unplanned Christmas truce happened all along the 500 mile front. Whether it lasted a few hours or a few days, it gave each man pause as he learned that the, human, that the enemy was a human being like himself. It was a time when the spirit of peace reigned supreme, even in the midst of war. Please join us in singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Mark Freund will lead us and the words will be in the chat. Oh, the words will be on the screen. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God, our creator, family all your let peace begin with me. Let
Imagine that horrible silence, that stillness in the trenches, the moment before the first man walks out across the space between enemies. The sheer terror of that quiet, the fear palpable, and the horrid waiting which we all know something about now. Sometimes waiting is dreadful and deadly and downright terrifying. Our fear accompanies us like breath, and when we wait, we can feel powerless. How many of us are there now just waiting for a vaccine, waiting for jobs to come back, waiting for life to happen to us, waiting for this nightmare to be over? It does seem that waiting is a dominant feature of life now. And I don't know about you, but I find myself waiting not in hope or peace, but in resignation. It feels like we're in one long advent, the season that our Christian siblings and the Christian new use among us are celebrating now, lighting their candles of peace on the second Sunday of the season of Advent, waiting for the birth of God and the turning of the world. We also dig trenches in our personal lives and in our relationships, don't we? We sit and we stew in that terrible silence. We may long to throw down the weapons we carry, the arguments and the grudges and the old hurts, but we are afraid. In our own pounding hearts, there lives the courage to climb out of the trench and take the first step, hands in the air, hoping to be met in no man's land. And there are the officers in us too, if we're being honest, those voices that tell us not to be weak with each other, not to apologize first, not to give up any ground. There is some wisdom in that protective voice in your head whose goal is to keep you safe at all costs. The trouble is though, that protective voice in your head, that primal urge to stay alive by scanning for threats, cannot tell the difference between a real threat and a perceived threat. The body does not know the difference between the danger and the appearance of danger, between the silence of the trench and the silence of a lover or a friend or even the silence of a peaceful night sometimes. And most especially now, our ability to tell what is a threat is so confused when there is a real and invisible threat everywhere. When our usual modes of relationship might kill us or kill those we love or max out hospital capacities and the tools we use to handle conflict and manage tension, feeding each other, holding each other's hands, hugging each other, getting away from each other, looking each other in the face. There's an extra veil of danger and it takes its toll on our relationships. There is a threat that is real. So if you're hearing this message and you are feeling like, wow, I really am in the trench and COVID is on the other side out of the trench and I just have to, you know, screw up my courage and get out of the trench. No, you are right. 
and you should stay in there as much as you can handle. I am not telling you to literally emerge, though there is danger around. Let's not get confused in metaphor when we're talking about this virus. I am telling you that cases are rising and you should take the utmost precautions with your physical safety to the extent that you are able and the safety of others. But let us return, having said that, to metaphor, to the trenches in our relationships. I imagine the first person who decides to climb out, though there are so many reasons to stay in the trench. So many reasons to shut your eyes, to try to shrink into yourself and hope that things will change, that terror will pass you by that someone else will do it first, and the officers who will shoot if you run away, whose role it is to keep you fighting. But someone climbs out anyway, heart pounding, hands raised. Advent, the season of waiting is not a season of Netflix and thumb twiddling and checking your watch to see if time has gone by already. This waiting in the expectant preparation for the birth of Jesus and for the changing of the world, according to our Christian siblings, is not a season of passive waiting. It is a season of living as if of waiting in hope, even as there is reason for despair, practicing peace, even in the midst of conflict, of waiting in joy, even though we may also be weeping, of waiting in love, even when there is much to fear and to hate. On that day in 1914, on that Christmas Eve, the soldiers lived as if there was peace in the middle of a devastating war. They did not control the outcome of the war which would last four more years. But they did, for one day, defy the imperial powers that sent them to die in the trenches. And they sang and celebrated. They saw themselves and each other as human beings, children of the same God, members of the same species, people, perhaps, whose true homeland is not England or Germany, but no man's land. The war would last four more years. 20 million people, civilians and soldiers would die. And 20 to 50 million more would die of the flu in 1918, undeniably spread further by the war. And the war, like all large scale conflicts, would end only when the most powerful people in each nation, the ones who do not see the front lines of a battlefield, the ones who never smell a trench, decide that enough of other people's blood has been spilled. But on this day, on Christmas of 1914, it was the men in the trenches on the front lines, the nobodies, the most expendable, the most replaceable, according to the logic of the empire, who decided against the wishes of the officers that the night would be silent of gunfire, that peace and stillness would reign and that the power to live in peace rested, even just for a moment, in their very own hands. Because sometimes all it takes is a small spark to light a fire, a first step to run a mile, the sun to just barely peek over the horizon to remind us that a new day dawns in the east. The story of the future is not yet written, and peace on earth is not just possible, but indeed already here, waiting for us to defy the powers of our day, to climb out of the trenches, and to meet on the ground that belongs to no one at all. At every level of your life, in every trench, 
in every ditch and every valley, from the very personal to the very political. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen.